Hello and welcome to another episode of the World War II podcast. I'm Angus Wallace. 75 years ago this month, that's May 2020 if you're listening in the future, the Germans finally surrendered to the Allies. While there were a number of different surrender ceremonies, the 8th of May 1945 was declared by the Western Allies to be Victory in Europe Day, VE Day. The Russians, oddly enough, celebrate on the 9th of May. In this episode, we're going to look at the closing period of the war from September 1944 to VE Day. But we're going to look at it from the German perspective. Loyal listeners will recall last year I talked to Jonathan Trigg about D-Day and the Normandy campaign from the German side of the lines. Well, we're going to pick up the story and discuss from September to the end of May 1945, which coincidentally is the topic of Jonathan's latest book, To VE Day Through German Eyes, The Final Defeat of Nazi Germany. But before we get started, just to remind you, if you enjoy the podcast every few weeks, why not help me put the show together with a small recurring donation each month of a dollar or so. It's easy to do via Patreon or PayPal, and you can find details at www2podcast.com forward slash donate. Those small donations help me find the time to do this for you. And it's a surprising amount of time I have to put in to research, recording, editing, and then the website and social media. I do try to give something extra to supporters of the show with bits that were left on the virtual cutting room floor, which I hope might be of interest. So that's www2podcast.com forward slash donate to sign up via PayPal or Patreon. John, it's great to have you back. Shall we start with a recap? So the Allies have galloped across France uh, after the German collapse in Normandy and the disaster at Falais. 1st of September, um, Eisenhower takes over as overall uh, commander for the Allies in the Northwest Europe. Um, at this point, what, what's the um, German army, army looking like? I mean, this, this for me was one of the, you know, the real revelations uh, that, that came through on the research, which was obviously I knew that you know, Falais, disaster... The Germans in full retreat. But what I didn't quite understand was, was just how chaotic it was. In that I thought German army discipline and ability to, 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 to throw things together quickly after, after shattering defeats, I thought you know, that solidified the front far quicker than it actually did. And that, that, you know, they literally did a fighting retreat out of France, into Belgium, into Holland and, and towards the German border. When actually, from, from all the testimony that I got hold of, it was absolute chaos. And people were, you know, literally throwing women and children behind them. It, the, the way that, that, that they emptied Holland of, of bicycles um, and so on, because they're so desperate to get back to Germany. Literally, there's, there's the Dutch, as they always are, you know, 14 bicycles per person. The Germans go through and they're like locusts. And, and, and they leave, you know, five unicycles and a pedlo behind them. I mean, it's just just amazing. And so, so I, I grew fascinated by that by that period because it was what happened, what suddenly, suddenly in the space of a few weeks, turned that route into a force that, that by the time Arnhem kicks in, um, which is only a few weeks later, of course, it is they're able to hold not just some 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 lightly armed paratroopers who fought incredibly valiantly of course but but a full on you know armor attack um and so on by an army that that had absolutely thrashed them uh, only a few bare weeks before and that i found just a a, a fascinating story because you know you read all those testimonies and you, you know, one of the things i really enjoyed was was seeing and, and i'd heard it a lot from Belgian and Dutch collaborators and French collaborators from some of my earlier books when they'd had to leave their home countries um, and, and head to Germany after, after the defeat in the West. But, but I, ha- you know, I thought, again, that was a measured move over a period of time. It wasn't, it wasn't the, oh, my God, literally, honey, you know, grab the kids, grab the rabbit, get into the wagon, we're going, you know, filling up train station waiting rooms, desperately trying to get on a train to get away from your neighbours. Because, you know, they were there with pitchforks and 
God knows what. Uh, and so on. And if you didn't get out quick, then then you were going to be you going to be in serious bother. What's amazing is the partisan attitude of the uh, Germany army at this time to, to its own units. Yeah, they seem happy to steal, appropriate whatever they needed for that unit, irrespective of who they were stealing it from, just to get out there. There's no larger German army thinking. They seem to, it's almost as though command and control seem to have broken down completely. Again, it, it was so surprising thinking actually that the command element of the, of the of, of, you know, German army in the West was still pretty much intact. Uh, you know, yes, battlefield commanders um, had, had fallen or been captured um, at Falaise, but their but their senior structures, corps and army, and and, and particularly uh, uh, commander in chief West uh, side, they were all still there. They're all intact. They they've all still got some level of communication, but they just seem to disappear. You're, you're you're speaking to the veterans and getting all the evidence and so on, and and it was absolutely it's down to platoon commanders, company commanders. You know, battalion commanders, almost at the, at the highest level, they're the only ones that seem to be exercising any level of control over their men. And it is literally over their men. It is nobody else. You know, no one's paying attention. Where's, where is that feigned German discipline? Because it seemed to be, no, it, it's devil take the highmost. Eisenhower takes over on the 1st of September. Now, you're quite scathing, I thought, of Eisenhower, accusing him of attacking everything and nothing. Now is that the saviour of the Wehrmacht in the in the in these co- coming months? The counterpoint, well, you know, I, I would pick, would 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 the Russians have done that? You know, would the would the Red Army um, under Moscow's direction, you know, Stalin and the Stavka, would they have said right for political or any other reason, we are going to disperse our efforts over the entire front? We're going to push the whole thing along. Um, because we feel that you know, in, a, in a measured way, um, etc. No, they wouldn't in any way, shape or form. They'd go for the jugular. As a political decision with a small p, it was, it was ideal. Uh, and it was very much Eisenhower. It was, it was his style of command. His, you know, he, he, it was consensual. He's managing a broad coalition because, you know, Montgomery, vinegary is, is perhaps a polite way of... of on his personality, I mean, some of the slights that he gave the Americans. I, you know, if I was if I was one of their generals, I'd probably want to bloody shoot him. And then they've they've also got to have the French, who were definitely wanting to to prove just how bloody difficult they can be from 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 an incredibly weak position. So I, I totally get. I think it was the right decision politically, but militarily, if you looked at it, if you if you know if you're there using a staff table exercise. And you're saying this is the position, uh, and you've gone with Eisenhower's broad front strategy. You'd be laughed out of the room. Red pen, big F on your paper. End of story. What would have got the you know the mark and would have got the the victory would be you know a single powerful thrust. Because that's again that's what the Germans would have done. Um, you know the Germans in their head they would have said right we are going to go you know Schwerpunkt and and, and so on and so on. We are going to put everything behind one. Might do for some feints. Um, you know, to, to help with envelopment or whatever uh, and so on. But we are going to absolutely punch, you know, punch hard and punch once. So how does that broad broad front front aid the Germans? It just gives them time. The, the overall issue in, in, in broad terms, you take one step back from the, from the Normandy campaign right up until, you know, in, in effect, almost the end of the war in, in, in the West, was logistics. Is that, is that, I mean, the Germans were never that, that good at logistics themselves. Uh, the Allies were, were fantastic at logistics, particularly the Americans. The Americans have always been good um, at logistics. They, you know, they funnel some of their best, uh, best officers and best people there, and that's what they do. But, but the genius of not attacking a major port on D-Day, as they did at Dieppe back in '42, was, was a total Achilles heel. When it came to the to the autumn campaign and, and and beyond, because you know their ability to land supplies on Omaha and Utah and you know gold and, and sword and what have you, and then truck them to the front was just not going to to, to provide them with a solution. And you know Hitler rightly uh, gets lambasted for an awful lot of his military judgments during the war, but the decision to uh, 
to, to turn more or less all the ports that they held into fortresses and tell the, tell the garrisons, no, you're not going to retreat, you're not going to surrender, we're not going to be able to resupply you, you but you are going to just stand and fight and, and then before you all die or surrender, blow the place up. Incredibly nihilistic, but very, very successful. Um, because, yeah, you've lost all those men, but you've lost them all anyway. What they've denied the Allies is the ability to supply the front. Yeah, I mean, Red Ball Express and, and, and all the other you know, convoy routes that the uh, Americans put in place, amazing, absolutely amazing, and really provided the Allies with the ability to move forward. But it was never enough. It was never enough. And, you know, and you've got someone like Patton and the Third Army, um, and, you go, and they're charging... And then all of a sudden they're stumbling. Well, what's interesting about that stumble is it forces Patton to actually look to see what he could fight, which then pulls him into that long drawn out campaign against um, Met. Yeah, which was, which was awful. He was absolutely dreadful. Something like that again begs the question: How good was he? Um, and you can you can always ask that, and, so, and everyone's entitled to their off their off day, their off battle, um, and so on. And for Patton, you know that that was his. It begs that question: Is going well? When he had everything going for him, air support, intelligence, logistics. But it wasn't a fight he was looking for, was it, Mets? He was going to bypass it. Very much so. And, and you know, it is, it's, it, I mean, it's funny because obviously, we, you know, the, the Allies got channeled through uh, Belgium and Holland uh, and into kind of northern Germany, where, of course, the, the, the traditional invasion route has always been further south. And I think that's where Patton wanted to go. But at that stage of the war, he just wasn't being listened to and... and it wasn't even so much that. It was more that Eisenhower decided on what he was going to do. He knew the war was going to be over um, in a relatively short period of time. And, and he was kind of managing that process rather than leading it. I mean, I always, I always think of Eisenhower. You know, what would I use to describe his capabilities as a commander? The, the one word that always comes to mind is manager, you know, not leader. But bearing in mind, I think the guy was incredible. I really do. And, and, yeah, he had all the qualities that we that we desperately needed that 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 time. But under another individual, could we have won the the war by Christmas? I think yes, we definitely could. Interesting. Because I always think of Eisenhower would let his commanders do the leading, and he managed the commanders. So you fought for your individual army group rather than part part of the whole. So September, September Eisenhower takes over, and you you, I think you use the phrase you know the September miracle. The, the Germans get a victory. You know, how was an army that was so defeated? How did it suddenly become so formidable in and around? We're looking, at, we're looking at Arnhem, aren't we? Yes. Really. This is for me that the, the the German army um, at all levels starts to it gets a kick up the arse. It kicks itself up the backside. It's it's that moment where you're you know you're running from running from the thug behind you, and then you go, what the hell am I running for? You know, he's no bigger than me. I'm just going to turn around and, and give it a go. And I think, you know, that's what kicks in at, at, at every level. And again, you, you, it came through in the testimony, you know, private soldiers, corporals, captains, majors. They were going, what the heck are we doing? We're the German army. You know, we're getting close to Germany. When are we going to stop running? Um, and, and that individual but collective view, I think, kicked in. And at the same time, the Western Allies then then just played a huge boob. The whole idea of the airborne army was was great for a massive set piece operation such as D Day, where it's it's one part of a of a whole, um, and so and that works very very well. But since then, you know, it was burning a hole in their pocket. They were desperate to use it. It was you know. I, I served with Paris when I was in the British Army myself, and they're incredibly proud of their cat badge uh, and of their capabilities, and rightly so. But but you know, and they let you know, and they want they they want to show their stuff and show what they can do at every level, be it, you know private soldiers, captains, battalion commanders, and whatever. And and you can imagine the para you know generals and commanders in Montgomery's ear, in Eisenhower's ear all the time, going, come on, let, let us at them, let us at them, let us at them. You know, we can, we can show them when, when, of course, they were completely unsuited for the operation. Yes, it was the whole market garden was an incredibly bold, you know, adventurous plan. And, 
yeah, that's why Bradley said it was the most un Montgomery thing he'd ever heard Montgomery ever ever say. And and in concept, I, I get it, but as a practical plan, it was another one of those staff officer red, big red F. Because you just you know, you just run through it and you go, so so we're going to to, to throw you know, lightly armed paratroopers with no armour support, no artillery support, relatively little air support, um, disperse them uh, along a whole route so they can't you know, mutually support each other. They're going to run short of ammunition. We won't even check that their communications work. Some of the big fallacies they use, for instance, in the... Um, you know, in Cornelius, in the film on Cornelius Ryan's book, they knew there's German armour there and so on. They know that there's... And even if they didn't know that there was SS tanks or whatever, they knew the Germans had artillery, they had, you know, self propelled guns, you know, they had mechanisation. They had weaponry that was going to be incredibly difficult for the paras to, to deal with. And and then they said, well, let's just let's just put them in anyway. And then and then all the problems that, that, that they then bring forward, right? They go, oh, we don't have enough planes to, to drop them all in one go. They go, never mind. We'll have to drop them miles away from the bridge they've got to take. So they give the Germans tons and tons of time to, to you know, to, to, to get in between them and stop them actually getting the bridge. Never mind. You know, everything was almost, never mind. We've decided we've got to do it no matter what. What I didn't kind of understand about it really was, you know, after looking at D-Day in the previous book, and just being in awe of the preparation, the, the sheer comprehensive complexity of Allied command and preparation. And then you're looking at something like Market Garden, and it's put together obviously incredibly quickly, but my God, it looks like it's been put together incredibly quickly. And it's, it's not that it was quick, it was just not very good. But it has an amazing effect on the German army. It seems to be a turning point for the German army in many respects. You know, is that internal of its own or is that applied through propaganda or is it, you know, I presume it must have been a huge propaganda coup that they do, they, they, they capture all these powers and they stop them and arm them. Uh, very much so. I mean, it's a very good question, that, Angus. And, and, and victory is a remarkably powerful tonic. And if you're, uh, you know, if you're in a, German army in the West or you know, German civilian at home or whatever it may be, all you've heard from, for, for several months is loss, defeat. Propaganda has said, oh, we'll throw them back into the sea in Normandy, and they don't. Uh, and then it's, oh, we're, we're, you know, we're going to knock them back to the beaches, and no, you don't. And, oh, you know, France will forever stay German. No, it isn't. Um, and then all of a sudden, you just see total loss, your army in them in the west is destroyed. You've lost not only France, you've lost Belgium, you've lost most of Holland. You know they're almost at the German border, and you're going, oh my God, this is just it's just disaster. We can't beat these people, and and there's there's an element, um, I think again in the in the you know the kind of propaganda. It was like you know after the 1940 campaigns, there was a there was a feeling Western allies and so on can't beat the Germans, you just can't beat them. You know, no matter what they do, we can shoot them, bomb them, you know, chuck tanks. doesn't matter. They, 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 they still beat us. We're just not good enough. But I think by the autumn of, of 44, the Germans were starting to feel an element of that. Like, going, we just can't beat these people. They're too, they're too strong. And yes, there was an element of, of, of racial delusion in it in terms of they were going, oh, it's, it's the material the classic, oh, they've got too many tanks, too many planes, and so on. It's not their men. Um, they're not as good as us, man for man, but they're, you know, they've got so many tanks and planes and all that. Type of thing. But, you know, I, th I think in their hearts of hearts, they're going, we just can't beat them. And then all of a sudden to win and, and, and you know, to, to, to beat back an attack, to, to beat it so well, and as you said, thousands of prisoners and newsreels and all this type of thing, you're thinking, at last, you know, we're turning the tide. If you're a German at that point, you want to hear about victory. You want to hear that, oh, no, all we're going to do is delay the inevitable defeat. You want to go, no, 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 we can we can turn this around. You've done it before. Um, all we needed was one big victory and we've got it. You know, now now it's the, the Allies' time, turn to suffer. But at the same time, there's an economic economic miracle happening. I don't know if it's economic miracle is a way to sort of put it, but there is a turnaround in industrial output as well. It now goes through the roof, doesn't it? This is, you know, one of the 
the huge fallacies um, and, and delusions from you know the German wartime history was that they were incredibly efficient. You know, German efficiency. Um, oh, they, they, you know, they, they, you know, it's all that horrible, uh, you know, stereotype. Oh, they plan so well and they're so efficient and everything they make is so fantastic. And and when you actually look at the facts and figures, it's complete rubbish. The, the German economy was almost throughout the war was hugely inefficient, was nowhere near as geared to to war production as Britain. Britain was far outstripping them. Yeah, and, and nothing to, to say about the Soviets and the American. I mean, the Americans were just in a, on a, on another planet. So you know, but we, there, there seems to be this thing that oh, they can make loads of things because they could make some good things. Tigers, they made less than fifteen hundred Tiger ones. Great. So a Tiger one can take five, six Shermans out before it gets destroyed. But when you've got another twenty backing them up, yes, it's horrible because you're going to lose a lot of men, but you're going to win. And and that's and, and that's the thing. And, and Albert Speer, um, in the autumn of 44, he had put in a lot of um, reforms to the German economy in, in the previous kind of year, 18 months. And those really started to, to bear fruit at that time. So there was a bit of a, uh, you know, serendipity on the timing. But, but yes, they, they really did. They started to, to, to strip out some of the inbuilt inefficiencies in the economy. You know, so instead of focusing on 28 variants of the of the same half track. We'll we'll just focus on five. So we'll actually, lo and behold, we'll we'll build more of them. We'll stop making nearly as many bombers, which we can't man anyway, but, and focus on single engine fighters, which we actually need to try and keep the Allied um, aircraft at bay. And that starts to make a real difference. Uh, and of course, they they formed the the, the the false grenadier divisions, which have always had an incredibly bad rep. Um, I mean, ever since I've you know, read about them, there'd, there'd be some, uh, you know, some some disparaging comment somewhere going, oh, these new, you know, this new false, they just ran away, they were rubbish and, and they were ill-trained and so on. And, you know, I found that out through my research that it was a half-truth at best. In terms of what the Germans tried to do and what they actually ended up with, they, they'd done a pretty good job um, on creating these new units to, to take advantage of, of all this new weaponry they might managed to produce. What always struck me about this, strikes me about the Volkswagen is they always do seem to get a bad rap, but my assumption has always been that you've got to look it through the prism of the time that you write. So if I think now, oh, they took anyone over the age of you know 45 and put them in the army and, and gave them a week's training and maybe be blooming hopeless. But in 1945, you do that. And actually, you're taking a large cadre of men who are trained fighting men from the previous war. And actually, these are men who have been trained and know how to uh, handle a weapon. And actually, I, it always struck me as how can they be completely useless when so many of them must have previously served and understood what was happening. So to give them a short uh, introduction to military service is more of a refresher that rather than uh, you know throwing them in the deep end with nothing. Yeah, it's also it's, it's what you're asking them to do so, so if you're, of course, if you're bringing um, uh, individuals on, and you're not expecting them to have to do the full panoply of military operations, then then you can truncate your training. So if you're not, if you're, if you're saying to them, we'll do a refresher on the basics, uh, and then we're not going to take you all the way up through, um, you know, small unit patrolling, through ambush, through disengaging in contact, to, to all this, you're going. What we're going to need you to do is man defensive positions and then do simple basic counterattacks. You know, you can teach someone quite quickly not to be fantastic at it, but to but to do what they need to do, particularly if they've had that that background training and, and experience before. And if they're if they're led well. So if you do have a, a cadre of experienced NCOs and officers, then you've got at least half a chance. Which then brings us to, uh, you know, if you're asking people to go into the defensive, I mean, the, the Germans have the uh, West Wall, the Seafree line. My assumption is as the Allies uh, drew nearer, which has probably been neglected in 1940, is suddenly been beefed up to be quite a formidable obstacle? Or was it just as hopelessly useless as the Imaginal line <laughs> proved to be? Yeah, as with all these things, it was a real mixture. Where it, it fell down... Was it was like the Atlantic War. It's too damn long. Great if you've got an army ten times the size of what they had, 
uh, and, and five times as long to, to get to get all the, the preparations in place. But as it was, it's too long. And, you know, they had to concentrate on certain patches. And that's that's what they'd done when they built it. Um, and a lot of that was tied into propaganda. So, you know, you can imagine the, the newsreels on the Wochenschau they used to have, which is, you know, lots of uh, young Germans on, on, you know, in the Reich Arbeit Dienst and so on, all of them stripped to the waist with spades and blonde hair and shoveling away and loads of freshly poured concrete. And, oh, you know, as they lever in huge guns and so on, that... that and then move to the next place for the next for the ne- for the next photo shoot, but it was a it was a real mixture. Um, so in some places, you know, for instance, around Arken, the defences were quite formidable, um, because of course that was where they considered again go, it was moving towards the south of the uh, the German line. That's where they considered that traditional invasion route. That's where the uh, the Allies would come. As it kind of went to the went to the north, it kind of petered out. But again, it was the advantage they had was that, you know, for once, they knew that they, the soldiers knew they were defending home territory. So for once, it wasn't defending the Atlantic Wall, oh, we're still in France, does it really matter as much or whatever, the Panther Line over in the east or whatever it may be. No, this is suddenly you're defending Germany. Some of the testimony, um, you know, that I got and some was absolutely brilliant. And, you know, they're, they're finding the bunkers and no one can find the keys. And they're literally, you can imagine them just going, didn't we give them to Heinrich? No, no, no. I think he gave them to Fritz. And he goes, no, no, Fritz. And, and, and you find out that, that Fritz had then hired out the two bunkers on his patch of land to, to the next to store his tools and his onions. So he's got the keys and we've got to find it and, and, and all that. It's just uh, it, or half the time because they, they put um, uh, dragon's teeth on roads. And, of course, once there's no war in the West after uh, 1940, all the local farmers said, oh, for God's sake, you know, I need to get to market or whatever. So they just dug them out of the way or tarmac them over. I mean, it's just, it's not what you would expect from, you know, you'd expect the Nazis to have everything regimented and, you, you know, nothing moved without their say so and so on. But it's just, it's it's all just, you know, bureaucratic muddle um, and so on. But, but yeah, they, they get back there and there's enough. There is enough there to, again, give the, the German troops some level of, of comfort you know, they haven't just got to an open field and they're told, right, get your shovel out, dig a trench. And this is where you're going to face the, the, the onrushing British and Americans. It's, yep, yeah, you know, this big bunker here and a few smaller ones here. They're not perfect, but they're, but they're better than nothing. You've at least got some cover. In you go once we get the keys from Herman. Which gets me to, so you've got an army that actually sorted itself out. It's pulled itself together. It's, 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 uh, held the allies at Arnhem. I guess has been fighting at the Hurtgen, which has been extremely costly for the Americans. They've fallen back on their own static defences. They've got a mass of material coming online. They've got huge uh, numbers of, of uh, new men uh, in the army, which makes you think about the uh, Watch on the Rhine, Battle of the Bulge, might not as be looking at it all right the, the objective and everything else might be you know ambitious but it certainly struck me as if i was sitting there as a german soldier and told someone told me we we're going on the offensive and i could could, could the infantryman look around and see all this did there was it all in play all the jigsaw pieces in place so I actually go well, actually us going on the offensive is not a bad idea in in december 44 all of a sudden you know what 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 arnhem gave them uh, and then with the comfort of the of the West Wall as well was was all of a sudden it did it, it transformed for for so many in the the German army um, their view of what was possible in the war, and they were going well actually maybe there there is this half a chance there's half a chance of doing something here by this stage of the war propaganda is absolutely relentless uh, for them as well so they're saying what we're being told is that the the devil is in the east that's where the devil is. We've got to do everything to keep the Bolsheviks out of out of Germany and out of Europe. We, that's what that's what we've got to do. And the way to do that is to we're not going to beat the Anglo-Americans, but what we're going to do is is they're sensible people. You know, they're much like us, and so on. we've always liked the British, um, et cetera, et cetera. What we need to do is just check them enough so they go. Do you know what? Why are we doing this? 
Why are we doing this? You know, it, we're, we're not natural allies with with Uncle Joe Stalin um, and, 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 and his commie friends. So, so what we're going to do is, yeah, we're going to make peace. And as long as you stay in Germany, that's going to be fine. Um, and then they're going to get all these wonder weapons, all these death rays, UFOs, submarines that never have to, 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 to come up for air or whatever it may be. Artillery guns that can fire shells a thousand miles, that sort of business. They were submerged under propaganda about, gosh, all these weapons that we can't tell you about. They're so incredible and we don't want to use them if we don't have to. Uh, but we will, and they're almost all ready to go. We just need to buy some time. And, you know, you can buy that time by, in effect, forcing the Anglo-Americans to make peace, and then we can turn all this weaponry that's, that's, that's almost ready, that's all, it's literally always it's weeks away, you can almost touch it. We're going to turn that on the communists, and we'll transform, transform the war. This is where German propaganda you know, was, was genius, in that they, Goebbels knew that you had to give people hope. So, so yes, you know, half the message he gave them was, well, if we're going to go down, we'll take the world with us and all this type of thing. But he, he also gave them, but maybe we don't have to. Maybe we don't have to go down to shattering defeat in, in the, you know, and lie in our own blood. Maybe we can actually pull this out of the bag. Um, and you've got your part to play. Just keep on fighting, keep on doing what you're told to do. And, and they mixed in, as with all great lies, you know, you mix in just enough truth for people to believe it. So, you know, oh, here's the new, you know, the new uh, uh, aircraft coming online, can sight jet fighters and rocket yeah. fighters. ME262 must look like a space age shooting past. Absolutely. You're going, where's the propeller? Yeah. How, how, how the... How in the name of Jesus does that thing fly? It's got no propeller. And then you're going, oh, that's nothing. Have you seen the ME-163 Comet? This thing is so quick, it's, it's unreal. It makes, the, it makes the 262 look like an ambulance. And they're real. You've seen the V1s. You've seen V2s. Rockets. Ballistic rockets. You don't even know what ballistic means. But he's going, this is just incredible. And then even as an infantryman, they're saying, oh, you know that, 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 car 98k rifle that, that that you've had that was literally your dad carried at, at verdun try this one try try a, a, a stug 44 and so on this is an assault rifle and you're going what's an assault rifle and you're going oh this because this thing can fire accurately you know accurate one round single round so on. and then you know semi-auto and all this automatic and you go this is unbelievable so this is what i was told in those propaganda films and some of it's actually true and then you're walking on the road and you hear this noise behind you and you see the biggest tank you have ever seen in your entire life. And, they, and you go, what in the name of hell is that? And they go, that's a king tiger. And you go, that is just, who is going to stop? And not one goes by, but two and three and four. And you go, we can't be stopped. You know, we've, we've actually got a chance. This, this is what I was told. And, and for once, it might be true. Uh, and that's 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 a powerful, powerful message to an army. But obviously, the war's still going on in the east. So, you know, as the watch on the Rhine, the Battle of the Bulge slowly runs out of fuel and and gets held up. Have there been uh, robbing uh, Peter to pay Paul on the eastern front? Oh, com- completely. I mean, it's it's a it's a very very good point, Angus. You know, this this is one of for me was one of the great conundrums because the 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 line has always been that the, the, the Germans and Hitler, they built up this, this strategic reserve that they have for the first time since Kursk. And it's where do we use it? And you could say there's parallels between how the Allies viewed the, the airborne army. Um, and it's where do we use it? And they go, well, if we use it against the, the Russians, I think Yodel uh, made the comment, well, we could destroy 30 Russian divisions and it wouldn't make spot a difference. But if we destroy 30 divisions in the West... That's, that's half their army gone. Um, and, so on, and they will definitely sue for peace. So, and, and particularly the ability to reach Antwerp, choke off Allied supplies, you know, split the Americans and the British. Would it have turned into a super Dunkirk? No. Um, I, th- I think that the situation uh, from, from kind of, you know, 40 to, to, to 45 was completely, well, late 44, early 45, was completely different. But it would have been a stunning victory. 
um, and it would have bought some time. But they, you know, their view almost was, you know, that would buy us some time to turn on the uh, to turn on the Russians. But knowing as we do that they didn't have this hangar load of, of secret weapons that was going to turn around, you think, well, turn to turn against the Russians with what? Uh, that that's why I, I you know projected in the book. What about putting a strategic reserve like that under the command of a, a Manstein and what he'd been able to do back in 43 with a miracle on the Donets, which had absolutely checked and then shattered the, 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 the Soviet thrust. And, and his force, you know, the strategic reserve then was bigger. They were defending their own territory. It was in much better tank territory, North Polish plain. What could he have been able to do um, with that reserve? It, I mean, I, I think, would it have won the war? Of course not. Um, could it have completely changed um, the complex of the ending of the war? Yes, I think there would be a possibility. Because I think if the Wacht am Rhein hadn't happened, we might have somehow summoned the, the nerve to get into Germany a lot earlier. That, that goes back to, I mean, you mentioned the Hergen Forest, for instance. That was a classic. There's a... It was that whole battle of the frontier, which which is very very under researched and, and, and under written about. Um, a lot of the time, to be honest, because I think they were uh, American battles rather than British. So maybe maybe there's more about them written in America. I don't know. Um, but it just seems that they they lack glamour. Market Garden has the glamour of um, some incredibly brave uh, individuals, but American and British and so on. Um, fighting against the odds, the glamour of jumping out of a plane, um, going up against tanks and, uh, and so on. Uh, uh, so, so that has the glamour. Whereas a, a poor old GI slugging through the pine needles of the Hurtgun in the pitting rain, freezing cold and, and so on, can't see his enemy that's shooting him most of the time and, and, and the conditions are absolutely dreadful. You're living in mud for weeks and weeks on end, where's the glory in that? And it's not even that you then they then saw it through to a, to a grand victory. They won, but won what? Look at look at this expanse of trees that we now have conquered. It, it lacks everything that people would want to reflect on and look at and, and to, to 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 celebrate um, in that way. But what it did, of course, was just waste so much resource, both human and material, but most importantly, time all that time um, and again that just allowed the germans you know train the new divisions get the new equipment to the front there's almost and that's again where you know you asked me earlier about eisenhower's generalship because i look at those border battles and go did they really have to be fought how you know how important were they uh, in the scheme of things did did they bring about for the for the loss of life and and, and you know blood and treasure and time did they change, you know, the, the war? Did they shorten it or whatever? And, and again, again, the answer I come to in my mind is no, it didn't. Is is that what it what it just did? It was activity for activity's sake, um, a lot of the time. And what they should have been focusing on is is one big armor attack. How are the Allies won in fillets? What have they done? What what are you know? What made it? Have, and, and, and in the end, it had been classic armour, heavy infantry uh, with overwhelming artillery and air support in, in big, expansive moves. That has, that, after a period of attrition, of course, but that, that's what had, had won and caused the Germans' collapse in France. And you are not going to cause a, a further collapse in the German army uh, by using infantry on foot in a in a pine forest on the border you know it's just not going to happen that is not going to end the war um so so i just i just think it was just a, a waste and it, was, it, it goes back to that piece saying if you transpose the dates back to the first world war black day um you know Monka's black day of the german army um in 18 in august and so and by november the war's over and there we are all those years later the Allied advance is literally as fast as a man or a horse can go, not even a horse. And so Second World War, we can go, you know, press, press the accelerator, you know, heavy right foot Donald, um, and, and, away, and away you go. And yet, there we are, 
thrashed them in August, and we're still there into the new year. Um, it's just crazy, crazy. So at what point does the German infantryman realise the war's over? My assumption is that on the east, they've probably <laughs> not been over for much longer than on the west, um, where it had just been relentless defence, especially as there's a massive Soviet... Uh, offensive in January isn't the 45 so they're on the back foot once more but at what point is it clear to the army? I, I think for for most of them in in the West when they lost France I, th- I think what they were hoping for there was, was some sort of miracle that would um, allow Germany to have have a conditional kind of surrender in the in the West and, and, and maybe carry on fighting in the East but in the East I think they, they knew from well, there's an argument that says most of them probably would have known from Stalingrad and a lot of them admitted it. But I think June 44 Bagration Offensive, you know, the annihilation of Army Group Centre, I think that really hit home. By the time, obviously, they were, they were uh, defending the Vistula um, and so on, then, then they knew. They knew. And, and I'm not, I didn't have a testimony from one veteran who served on the East um, who at that point thought they were going to do anything but but lose. The interesting thing was when I did talk to them about it was trying to understand from them what they meant by lose. Because of course for us, you know, we know well it's it's unconditional surrender, and you know Hitler and all the Nazis gone, country under occupation, disbandment of the armed forces, and so on. And and they struggled with that, talking them through that scenario because of course they saw defeat kind of in the in the prism of what happened back in the first world war so yes that they yes they lost but the army was still in place stab in the back stab in the back so you know their country wasn't occupied and then yes they'd had all of the you know the versailles um issues imposed on them and so on but they 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 couldn't contemplate that it would just be allied soldiers and russian soldiers and what have you wandering around their towns and cities and villages that they would all be in prison of war camps, the country would be uh, have collapsed, government would have disappeared, and so on and so on. They just couldn't see that. You can understand it in a way. I mean, it's like, um, yeah, you know, the, the, the brilliant film Downfall, and you've got uh, you know, Bruno Gantz as, as, as Hitler and so on. But then there's all the people around him, and there's that crazy scene where Himmler is talking, you know, to, to the likes of, 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 I think he was talking to Albert Speer, and he's going, oh, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm getting out of Berlin and I'm going to go and try and meet the Allies and, and talk to them about having some sort of conditional surrender and then maybe turning against the Russians together. Um, and, he, and he's like going to him, oh, do you think I should give him the, you know, the Nazi salute when I meet him or shake his hand? And you, you, you're going, clearly, you're mad as a box of frogs. So if you think that, that anything like this is going to happen... At the same time, you, you find out that that's, that's real and that he did have that conversation and he believed it. So was he, you know, delusional? It's probably an element of that. But it's also in, in the emotional frame, they couldn't contemplate what total and utter defeat looked like. They just couldn't. Um, and they thought at some point, things will change. The Allies will turn around and say, the Western Allies will turn around and say, OK, you've learned your lesson. It's going to be a bit Versailles-ish again, but we're not going to completely crush you. And they thought a, a miracle would occur that would keep the Russians out. Is that what the werewolf units were all about then, do you think? Because I, I had them as a sort of an, an official expression that the war was lost and were going to be overrun. But on the back of what you're saying, you know, these werewolf units, you, which were going to be sort of in t- terrorist units uh, you know, fighting occupation, is, are they actually formed to fight occupation in enemy occupied territory with the belief that would there be still some to german germany to fight for yes i mean, they, you know they, they very much set them up with the view going look we, we may temporarily particularly in the east lose portions of germany the east pressures or you know silesia or whatever it may be so we might lose bits but don't worry there'll always be this kind of central heartland and just as with the the, the soviet partisan movement um, earlier in the war, you know, you will be a, a branch of the armed services. Um, you will just happen to, you know, be 
sitting in occupied Silesia and whatever, um, and you'll pass intelligence back to us and we'll direct your targets and, and we'll make sure that you get supplies and so on. And those last kind of six months, they consistently came out with, with, with quite a few ideas, which in a lot of ways you can see the sense of, but they were just half-baked and half, uh, half put through. Nothing was comprehensive. Again, it goes back to the element of, of how efficient were the Germans. Oh, they're hugely efficient. No, they're not. They weren't then. Um, I doubt if they ever have been, to be honest. It, it, it is an aura which we have bestowed upon them, and they, they have allowed us to, to maintain. Oh, we'll do, this, we'll do this idea, and we'll have some, some crazy training. And again, some of the testimony had on, on some of the training concepts that they had for, for, for the werewolves. It's just utter madness. So we'll half choke someone. Uh, and then send them on a, you know, to do an obstacle course for four miles because that will make them a really good guerrilla fighter. And you're going, I'm not entirely convinced that that will. And it's just, yeah, it's just all a bit, all a bit potty. And one thing that we do know is perhaps true of the German character, maybe less so now, um, but at the time was that as a society, um, very much the, the a belief in order, law and order, and everything in its place and a place for everything that comes through in, in so much the testimony that, that people believe that, people believed in, in very much a social order. And guerrilla movements, terrorist movements, don't operate within any sort of social order. Uh, they feed on chaos, on total and utter chaos. And that's, that, that is the, you know, that really is their, their milieu. And the, the German character at the time, just not suited for it. In the slightest. I mean, this is why they couldn't say, oh, Germany's going to get overrun and then, you know, you're all going to fight. They had to know, no, you'll be directed. You'll be part of something greater, something with more order, something with more structure. Turning around to them and saying, oh, no, no, you're just on your own, chum. Um, and you've got to, you know, do it by yourself. Well, that's just not, that's not their way. I wonder if that's why they were, they, well, they were never really a thing, were they, at the end of the war? They just sort of... Uh never happened no and i think you know where where perhaps they did have some success was in the east but of course the, the soviets aren't going to publicize oh today you know we we got an ambush by 150 werewolf fighters and we lost five tanks and, and 70 men and, and so i mean there's there's an element of that i mean we know um obviously now that there were quite some significant resistance movements in some of the um, occupied countries, the Baltic states and Ukraine being the, the, the biggest. And some of that, you know, we managed to unearth records that say there was fighting, um, uh, including whole divisions of NKVD troops. I mean, my God, divisions, you know, not not talking about a sentry being shot in the dark from 10 yards away. You're talking divisions of guys um, being involved in, in almost set piece battles with resistance fighters in, in the Estonian forests and the Ukraine and into into the early 50s but, but again they weren't going to publicize that then so I, I should i think whether it's buried deep in soviet records i'll be fascinated to know that, that there were a lot more incidents of werewolf activity in the east than have ever come to light but in in terms of the scale of things it was always going to be small obviously the, the soviet way of dealing with that is they, they carried out an ambush find the nearest village and just level it they, they and the Germans had that in common. That was the, that was the German approach to Soviet um, partisan activity. So, you know, the Germans kind of reaped the whirlwind um, of that one. It was interesting about the end of the war is it comes in the West. It's a, it's a massive encirclement of uh, one of the German army groups, which now escapes me. Army Group B in the Ruhr, yeah. Um, now, is that a total collapse? Is it an encirclement of an army group or is it just an encirclement of, at this time, is it encirclement of an army group? Or is it just an encirclement of a rabble? Is it a complete collapse in the West? It's a, it's a, it's a very good point. I would definitely say it was, it was the only time in the West that um, we did encircle an army group. We, we failed to do that at, at Falaise. Um, we hadn't done it, uh, of course, obviously through the autumn and the winter. By that stage, the, the biggest issue the Germans had was mobility, and they just didn't have any. They'd lost Plursty back uh, at the end of August. Um, so all the Romanian oil had literally dried up. Um, they'd used all the reserves they'd managed to, to get back from the Italians. 
um, after you know they 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 taken the country after Mussolini's fall, and and they are literally eking out a few barrels from Hungary and 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 Austria, mainly Hungary, which is one of the reasons obviously Hitler was so obsessed um, with fighting in Hungary, which was why why it's so far away from the from the uh, where the nexus of the battle would be clearly. But it was it was by that stage the, um, the the desire for a few pints of petrol was was driving war policy. It really really was. Army Group B, Dell's Army Group in the Raw. Yes, it was functioning. Yes, it was structured. But it just couldn't move when the Allies finally crossed the Rhine, or more importantly, when when Montgomery crossed the Rhine um, and formed the kind of the, the northern pincer. Easy would be the wrong word because, you know, men were still dying in large numbers and, and, uh, and so on. And fighting is never um, is never easy. But, you, you know, you, you didn't have a full, a fully functioning German army group with mobility, with tanks and so on that could that could move and counter and punch. Most of the units were just stuck where they were. And then all of a sudden, once, once they were gone, um, they were in effect, the main um, fighting force in the Western Army. So, so with them gone, there was there was just there wasn't anything. Scattered remnants between the Allies and, and, and Berlin. Those remnants again, same issue, lack of fuel. So couldn't intervene. You know, they couldn't they couldn't kind of pull back and form another defensive line in any way. It was it was literally you're, you know you're you're taking the keystone. Out of a out of an arch, out of a bridge, um, and then and then everything just goes with it, because the, the other bits might have some solidity, but without that keystone, it just doesn't work, stops functioning, uh, and 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 then again, this is where, you know, we have another, uh, would it be failure? Because would taking Berlin for the Western Allies before the Russians would have that made a massive difference? I think to be honest, at that stage of the war, probably not. Um, I mean, I think the idea of some, some you know, Alpine redoubt um, in the in the south of the country, filled with, you know, hundreds of thousands of blonde, blue-eyed SS fanatics, with super tanks and all jet engines on their backs and, and all this type of thing. No, I, I think that was obviously complete fallacy. And I, I think uh, if it was believed at senior R level, then, then I'd say that was rather silly. Um, but again, why thrash yourself to get to Berlin um, and challenge the Russians at that at that point in the war? It wouldn't have shortened it by any stretch, um, and you'd have been the one ended up fighting in the ruins of Berlin. Yeah, it, it, it struck me as is, uh, something that struck me was if the Russians had been closing in on that army group in the west, would they have held out longer? Just because it was the Russians. Yes, I, I think absolutely, absolutely so. And you, you can see it. And again, that was one of the things that came through um, in all the witness statements from all the soldiers um, that I talked to. I mean, yeah, obviously the book is mainly focused on the Western Front, but because so many more German soldiers fought on the Eastern Front, by nature you get more testimony from from the East. The the guys that fought in the West, there was an element of ambivalence that they felt, and of course they wanted to win. But they didn't feel a hatred or a fear um, of the Western Allies in the, the same way that they did against the Soviets. And, it, and it's, it is that mixture of hatred and fear. First, they didn't want to surrender to them in the slightest. They were all desperate, and, and understandably so. Um, but two, they were going, no, you know, and if we are going to go down, we're going to go down fighting. And we, we are going to do everything we possibly can to stop these people because they are the devil. That's how they viewed them. They really did. And, and, you know, it wasn't just one or a few or maybe even a majority. It was universal in all of them. And yet there's an element of um, the, the propaganda of the time made them, made them out to be that. But, but it was stronger than that. It was, it was actually, I would say, it was conviction um, on the, the, the part of the soldiers is that they really felt that these devil incarnate, and we have to do everything we possibly can to keep them out of Germany and, and away from half and home. So when, when the war ends, and we've alluded to this already, you know, there's no question that they've lost in the field. There is no stab in the back. How does the German army feel about it? Does it 
just shrug its shoulders, sigh of relief and want to go home? Or it, There's a mixed bag of feelings for a heck of a lot of soldiers by that stage of the game. It was. We just want to end. We just want to go home. Those whose families were in the east were desperately worried uh, about where they would they have a home to go to. For the officer corps, for a lot of the officer corps, it was, you know, in particular, they found it a real affront to their professional pride. Uh, and many of them felt that they couldn't, as you said, they couldn't rely on the stab on the back in the back theory. So they had to, to, to find another reason. I'd always been struck by the number of memoirs and whatever that had been put out particularly by, by senior German officers after the war, um, that, that universally pointed the finger at Hitler. And, and that, that has become the standard narrative. So the standard narrative was that if, if only Hitler had listened to his generals and let them run the war, they would have won by country mark. And the Allies, you know, all, were always going around, oh, thank God for Hitler, he's our best general. You know, the decisions he makes means that victory is assured. And... I, I, would, I wouldn't dispute that as false, but I would maybe dispute it as um, a, a complete truth. I would say that, that, that you know, that there's, there's far more complexity to it um, and that Hitler, yes, indeed, made some absolutely dreadful you know, decisions and so on. And he should have listened to his generals or, or perhaps given them more leeway than he did on, on, on occasions, etc., but it always seemed just a bit too, a bit too pat, a bit too easy, a bit too. It was all him. It was all him. You know, if it hadn't been for him, we would have won. And 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 you're going, well, you know, would that have been a good thing? <laughs> it, you, you're, you know, as the German generals start, you're, you're going, oh, if it hadn't been for Hitler, we would have won the war. Wouldn't that be great? Well, would it? No, I would say no. It wouldn't be good. So so I'm glad, therefore, that Hitler led you down that way. But you know, there, there was a. A real feeling, I think, among the, you know, the veterans as well, that, that this, this, yes, they were, a lot of them were glad it was over and they could go home, but an absolute emptiness and, and, and the feeling of, of what was that all for? All that sacrifice, um, you know, total, total disillusionment with society, with themselves. It was, it was shattering. Absolutely shattering. I mean, that again came through in Old Testament. It, there, there wasn't a sense of it all with guys just going, "Well, that was it. I'm just going to go home and just just move on." They they were fundamentally shattered to their core, uh, and it took so many of them a long time to kind of get themselves back on track and in some sort of. And then when they did, they all did. It was it was almost the, the sense I got was it was almost like the, the September miracle. It was like a personal but collective view that actually now we've got to get on with life again so so you know we've got to get back to work and rebuild a house rebuild a home find a job earn some money start to you know settle down start to raise children and and so on and so on incredible to 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 hear them but very painful for them as well as with all these things you know they, they they you've got to look past the stock phrases they wouldn't say i'm glad we lost but they say, you know, I'm, I'm glad it's over and, and you know, and, oh, I definitely want peace and Europe's a lot better off now and so on. But you can tell half of them are just saying that because they feel as though they have to. But there, there is, from a lot of them, there's, there's, there's always a, a wistfulness that kind of, you can almost see it in their eyes where they're like going, oh, wouldn't it be great if we'd won? Wouldn't, wouldn't, that, wouldn't that be fantastic? And there, there is, without a doubt, an element of that and, you know that that generation is, and they're they're passing now, so that will disappear, and and I don't think their children have it at all. But yeah, there, there was definitely a we came so close, so close. Yeah, we well, almost did it. Nobody wants to be on the losing side, do they? That is very very true. Well, shall we leave it there, John? It's always a real pleasure to chat, folks. If you want to pick up a copy of John's book, I'll put a link on the website. It is. To Vieda through German eyes, the final defeat of Nazi Germany. That's all from me, but I'll be back again sooner than usual as I've managed to squeeze in a bonus episode for you this month. 
In the next episode, I'll be looking at Clementine Churchill. She's an intriguing lady, usually cast in the shadow of her husband, Winston Churchill. So, stay safe, don't forget to sing happy birthday twice while washing your hands, and I'll be back again in a few days with more World War II talk. I'm Angus Wallace, and thanks for listening. Oh, and P.S. for patrons, there is a bit more of John and I chatting. He's looking at Russia for his next book. Bye.